So we'll get started anyway uh, for five minutes. The Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, five minutes is hardly enough time for me to go over all the things I'd like to go over, but I will begin and uh, finish it another day. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to rise and uh, discuss the Common Sense Firearms Licensing Bill. I'm pleased to see the government is standing up for the rights of law-abiding Canadians who enjoy and use firearms. As you know, Mr. Speaker, I've been fighting for the rights of law-abiding hunters, farmers and sport shooters for two decades now. I fought the introduction of the wasteful and ineffective long gun registry from the time it was introduced by Alan Rock under the previous Liberal government, and I was proud to stand in this place two years ago and support and pass the ending of the Long Gun Registry Act. The gun registry was the epitome of political pretense. It pretended to protect us by reducing, cr by reducing crime, but in fact, it did just the opposite. A long and short of it is that criminals don't register their guns and they don't obey laws. And it was about time people realized that spending $2 billion of taxpayers' money to keep a list of property of individuals predisposed to obey the law was not a good use of resources. And equally, I'm glad to see that this bill today takes strong measures to focus the use of resources on that which actually prevents crime, rather than simply seeking to disarm Canadians. This legislation will streamline licensing and eliminate needless red tape for responsible gun owners, and it's something that I have advocated for many years. In fact, some measures in Bill C-42 also can be found in my 2009 private member's bill, C-301. They're housekeeping items that will simplify procedures without reducing public safety. Items like merging the possession-only license with the possession and acquisition license, for instance, or making the authorization to transport a restricted firearm, more commonly known as ATT, a condition of a restricted license. Let me explain for those in the House who are less familiar with firearms regulation what an ATT is. An ATT is a document that specifies where a licensed restricted firearm owner may take their property. It may contain a variety of locations or it may be very specific. This is dependent on the whim of the provincial chief firearms officer. It's not in legislation. If travel to a location outside of those previously approved is needed, more forms must be filled out and more approval must be sought. Some may say that this level of rigor is needed as restricted firearms could be dangerous in the wrong hands. But the fact of the matter is that those with restricted firearms licenses get a background check every day. And the application for an authorization to transport isn't even shared with local law enforcement. It's the definition of wasteful paperwork. And it's frustrating for me to sit here and listen to people talk about this thing when they know very little about it. And hopefully, if we get to questions and comments, I can explain more about the lack of knowledge here uh, in regards to this issue. The government trusts a restricted license holder to have a restricted firearm in their home. They should trust them to travel to appropriate locations to use the firearm. Some have said that this will allow for conceal and carry by the back door. Absolutely false. All safe transport requirements remain in place, such as unloading the firearm, renting it inoperable, and placing it in a locked case. The logic that these ATTs, which are not shared with law enforcement, will somehow reduce crime is the same logic put forward by those who think that registering a firearm will somehow reduce crime. At the end of the day, violent crimes committed with firearms are committed by evil people with evil intentions. No amount of paperwork or regulation will divert, divert them from their path of wanton destruction. What will stop them is being incarcerated for a lengthy period of time, and this is why we passed mandatory prison sentences for those who commit crimes with firearms. And we created a specific offense for drive-by shootings. These measures truly increase public safety and reduce the cost of crime. That is what we're focusing on, tackling those who are predisposed to break the law rather than those who are simply trying to enjoy a way of life that has been part of Canada's heritage since Confederation. The focus on safe and sensible firearms policy is why this bill amends the criminal code to establish firearms provision, 
orders for those convicted of domestic violence. Once this bill is passed, those convicted of serious domestic violence offenses, which include offenses uh, against a spouse, common law partner, or dating partner, will be subject to a mandatory prohibition from owning restricted or prohibited firearms and from owning long guns for a minimum of 10 years. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the time. I'm sorry I had to split this bill and speak to it at a later date, but I look forward to some healthy debate in this House uh, because there are some serious misconceptions which need to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville uh, will indeed have another five minutes uh, when the House uh, next uh, takes up debate, and of course the usual five minutes for questions and comments.